Hi, hello, hi. Uh, you may be wondering right about now, Aaron, it's not Friday, what are you doing? Where are you lost? Uh, but no, I'm not. It was uh, it was deliberate. So as some of you may know, October 10th, which is today, is Mental Health Awareness Day. And so I wanted to release this video to talk about something that affects a lot of people around this time of year. But before we get into it, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to Pride Counseling, who were gracious enough to sponsor this video, meaning that I could afford to get it captioned, which is really exciting. Pride Counseling is an online counseling service that is specifically catered to helping the LGBT Q plus community and I've been using it for a long time and I really like it so I just I was I'm really excited that they wanted to sponsor this video I just I appreciate that if you want to sign up for pride counseling and also support future collaborations between me and them you could use the link in my description um, I'm I don't make a commission or any money off of people signing up at all it just encourages them to work with me in the future which is good because when I have sponsored videos, I could afford captioning, and that's really exciting and really great. So, uh, yeah, cool. Thank you. Let's uh, jump into today's topic. So, uh, before I do that, <laughs> promise this is the last side note, I just want to give a quick trigger warning, because we're going to be talking about mental health, depression, uh, the holiday season, family relationships, stuff like that. I just, I just wanted to warn you so that it doesn't catch you off guard and you can be prepared and all that good stuff. So, without further ado, uh, what's today's topic? Well, today I want to talk to you all about seasonal affective disorder, also known as uh, seasonal depression. So the reason I want to talk about uh, seasonal depression or seasonal affective disorder, or SAD as it is known for short, yes really, that's the actual acronym. I feel like I feel like that was deliberate. I, you like you knew what you were doing. Anyway, the reason I want to talk about this is because Mental Health Awareness Day falls on October 10th, and this is around the time that most folk who deal with seasonal affective disorder start to feel it. Um, seasonal affective disorder can also be the inverse, so for some folk it lasts from fall until about spring, and for some other folk it lasts from spring to fall, so some people actually experience it throughout summer instead of throughout winter. We will get to that later, so let's jump into it. What is seasonal affective disorder? Well, as I just said, some folk begin manifesting feelings of depression when the days start to get shorter and starts to get dark earlier. In a nutshell, that's kind of what seasonal affective disorder is. It is, it is periods of depression that are typically triggered by and go along with the changing of the seasons. So why does this happen? What causes depression in general is very broad and can't really be condensed into one video. Um, it has a lot to do with neurotransmitters like serotonin, all that stuff that I'm sure a lot of you know about, but specifically in focusing on seasonal affective disorder, what causes that? What causes the seasons to be a trigger for depression? Um, so there are, there are a couple of factors that come into play here, so I'm going to divide them um, into the psychological factors and the physical factors that cause or contribute to these feelings of depression um, in relation to the changing of the seasons. So to start with the psychological, some researchers have linked seasonal affective disorder, particularly the type that takes place in winter, to the holiday seasons. Um, this is because a lot of our major holidays, or at least a lot of the major holidays that we typically observe in Western culture, take place around this time. There's Thanksgiving. Uh, I know throughout the month of October, there are a lot of pretty major Jewish holidays taking place. There's Christmas and New Year, all that stuff. It all kind of happens in the same time. So again, this in and of itself comes down to a lot of different variables, but to kind of break it down a bit. Um, firstly, this busy time of the year also overlaps with when school starts again and when folk tend to experience a pickup in pace in the work environment as well. But the holidays themselves could be one of the triggers, especially for folk who are part of the LGBT community, particularly trans folk with, you know, being around family often coincides with being misgendered and people using the wrong name. Even if you are not trans, if you're queer, oftentimes family may invalidate you. You could literally be a woman bringing a woman to a family gathering and introduce her as your girlfriend, your life partner, and they'll be like, so when are you bringing home a nice boy? Like, it's just, you know, you deal with that, that stuff around the holidays, so that takes a toll on folk. But it could also be a really difficult time for folk who may have 
lost a loved one, who aren't close with their families, uh, who don't really have a supportive social circle or a big network of friends. Because there's a lot of social pressure to be with the people you love. There's the nostalgia of it. If you grew up with someone, let's say, and you don't have them in your life anymore, you remember what it was like back then and now you feel lonely, all, all that stuff. That makes it hard, you know? There's also the financial stress of it all. With holidays comes the expectation for gift exchange and for hosting and preparing food and bringing food and it could not only exacerbate the situation for folk who are in a tight financial spot but also just make them feel kind of bad you know it just it's not it's not a great feeling so for all of those reasons <laughs> piled on top of the whole like you know school starting you might not have time to see your friends and you know relax and have fun and work might be really hectic it's just it's a lot psychologically and emotionally and mentally to be dealing with so those are some of the psychological and mental and emotional factors involved in what causes or contributes to the symptoms of seasonal affective disorder. However, there are a lot of non-psychological reasons. There's a lot of physiological reasons why someone might experience this. Uh, you could even be someone who's like, I love the holidays and I'm doing great in school and I have no financial issues and my family's fantastic and I still deal with seasonal affective disorder. And that's totally valid because again, there is a really strong uh, physical basis in why this manifests itself. So before I get into the physical symptoms, I think it's a good place to kind of make the distinction between seasonal affective disorder that takes place in the winter versus that which takes place during the summer. So seasonal affective disorder that takes place in winter typically involves symptoms of lethargy, lack of energy, feeling tired, oversleeping, having trouble getting up, having trouble getting out of bed, overeating, having cravings for foods that are high in carbohydrates, all that stuff. Whereas seasonal affective disorder that takes place in the summer typically involves symptoms like insomnia, agitation, anxiety, difficulty eating. So the reason why I'm making the distinction between these two and their typical symptoms is because it goes hand in hand with one of the main theories as to why seasonal affective disorder happens. The main theory, or at least that which I'm going to focus on, is that it's related to our body's production of melatonin. Melatonin is the chemical that our body releases that regulates our sleep-wake cycle. When your body makes melatonin, those are the signals for you to go to sleep. So like, you know, feeling like your eyes are really heavy, kind of nodding off without much control over it, uh, yawning a lot, that, you know, that feeling when it's like, gravity is just pulling you towards sleep. Those are all sleep signals that are typically triggered by your body producing melatonin. It's telling you to go to bed. The way that this sleep-wake cycle works is basically with the sun. So sunlight or the lack of sunlight is how your body creates this natural cycle. Um, when it gets dark out, your body starts to produce melatonin and that lets you know that it's time to sleep and it helps you fall asleep. Whereas when the sun is up, you're making less melatonin or you're not making any melatonin and so you're energized, you're awake, you're ready to do stuff. How this coincides with seasonal affective disorder is that in the winter, the days are much shorter, it gets dark much earlier, the sun will be down by 4 p.m. as opposed to during the summer when the sun goes down at like 9 p.m. So a lot of people will actually produce more melatonin around this time. And the overproduction of melatonin has been linked to depression because again, melatonin makes you feel tired and lethargic and makes you wanna to go to bed. Um, and if you're producing tons of melatonin, then of course it's harder to wake up, you're going to sleep more. Um, and some people's bodies just have more trouble regulating the production of melatonin during this season when the nights are really long and the days are quite short. The inverse is also true for seasonal affective disorder that happens during the summer for some folk. With the days being longer and the nights being shorter, they're producing less melatonin, meaning that it's harder for them to fall asleep, it's harder for them to feel relaxed or feel calm. So some folk will experience insomnia and agitation and anxiety. And so that's kind of the theory of how melatonin plays a pretty major role in triggering seasonal affective disorder. Not everyone will have seasonal affective disorder. Some folk might even experience seasonal affective disorder some years and then not experience it other years. There are a lot of factors that come into play here. Again, it's this combination of the physical and the social environments, all that just kind of comes together where it's like if you are already feeling stressed and overwhelmed and then the holiday season's coming up and you don't have energy and that's making you fall behind in school, like 
like you see they, they all kind of pile on top of each other there's not just one thing where you can be like it's that that's the thing that's that that's what's doing it so yeah all that to say it's very complex so why am i telling you all of this in my experience understanding what i'm feeling and why i'm feeling it is really empowering and is the first step in finding a healthy way to manage my symptoms. There tends to be this mentality surrounding uh, mental health disorders particularly, where a lot of folk will personally blame the character of the person who is dealing with these conditions, rather than acknowledging the fact that, like, this is just something that happens sometimes. Nobody is saying to just, like, give in, surrender to the depression. It, like, like, no one, no one is saying that, no one is that's, that's not the point I'm trying to make here. I'm saying that it's important, in my opinion, to recognize that, like, this just happens sometimes and it's not your fault. And understanding what is happening and why it's happening helps us to equip ourselves with the tools necessary in order to navigate these situations in the most healthy way possible. So that involves not beating yourself up over it or not blaming someone for not trying hard enough to be happy. It's not about that. Like, your body's literally producing the chemical that makes you sleep. Of course it's hard for some people to wake up. It's not laziness. It's anyway, I just have a lot of feelings. Um, so all that being said, what treatments are available for seasonal affective disorder? Uh, well, there are a number of treatments. One that is particularly kind of unique to seasonal affective disorder is light therapy. What light therapy is, is actually literally using light as a therapeutic treatment of the symptoms of depression. This can be done in a number of ways. One way that people will implement light therapy is by using a special light called a depression light or a depression lamp. Essentially, this is just a light that is made to mimic daylight. And this helps some folk, it doesn't help others. For me, it has not been particularly useful. My brain just is kind of like, ah, gotcha, I know, I know what you're up to. That's, I, don't, I don't know, for me it didn't work. But I do know some people who use a depression light and who see a noticeable difference in their energy levels and it helps them kind of just like wake up in the morning and start their day feeling just a little more energized. Another way to implement light therapy is uh, by just using natural sunlight. So this could be difficult, of course, with the shorter days, with the fact that it tends to be a little cloudier, it rains, it snows, all that stuff. But um, when it is sunny outside, or at least when it's daytime and there's a little bit of daylight, opening the curtain, sitting near a window, sitting outside, just getting as much daylight as you can could help for a lot of people. For example, um, like I live in a semi-basement apartment, so it's quite dark in here even if I do open the curtains. It'll help me to go to my school, let's say, to study, because uh, my school library is just all windows, so no matter where I sit, I'm getting some daylight and it helps to energize me. Other days, if I'm feeling up to it, I just make my one first task of the day to come into my office and open my curtains, because I know in the morning, I always get direct sunlight in here, and even if I feel really crummy and really tired, just seeing the sunlight kind of flood the room helps a little. It just helps. I don't know how to explain it. It just, it energizes me, and I like it. So I've realized that although I am not a person who likes to sit in direct sunlight, um, I do very much enjoy indirect sunlight, so essentially just like a just a house plant another thing that's worked for me in terms of light therapy has actually been uh christmas lights or fairy lights i don't know what you call them i'm not sure anyway i've realized that fairy lights christmas lights they make me really happy they make my space more pleasant to be in they make things a little brighter they help on cloudy days on gray days it's just it makes my space a little brighter and that helps me feel just a little better it's not it's not a cure of course it's just you know the depression lights did nothing for me it kind of just felt like sitting in front of my ring light um but the christmas lights definitely help so I don't know, just throwing that out there. As for a seasonal affective disorder that affects people during the summer, so the one that causes um, agitation and anxiety and insomnia around the summer months, uh, what's been really helpful for a lot of folk has actually been melatonin supplements. Uh, you could find melatonin supplements at almost any pharmacy or health food store. You don't need a prescription to get them. Anyone could just go in and buy them. Uh, I do, however, recommend talking to your doctor or pharmacist or a nurse before doing it. Don't just, you know, take advice from some guy on the internet. But melatonin supplements help when you're having trouble falling asleep because your brain is not producing melatonin. They've been useful for me in falling asleep. They do not help me stay asleep. So my specific brand of insomnia, which is just pain-somnia, I'm awake because of pain, doesn't 
always super benefit from melatonin, but at least it helps me fall asleep. Fair warning, it has been known to cause nightmares for some folk, myself included. Sometimes it just causes really vivid dreams, but I'm just, I'm telling you if you're prone to night terrors, that's just something that you might want to know because sometimes pharmacists don't tell you things. And you know, it's one of those things that I feel like you should probably be told, so. Just throwing that out there. Lastly, another course of treatment is of course therapy, which brings us back to today's sponsor, Pride Counseling. No, but like in all seriousness, as I said before, Pride Counseling is an online counseling service. It is the online counseling service that I've been using for months before they ever even sponsored my videos. And it's a counseling service that's specifically geared toward helping the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, this is because their counselors are all very well experienced and well versed on things involving our community. And also a lot of them are queer themselves. And you could actually specifically request to have a queer counselor. You could also request to have a religious counselor or a religious queer counselor or an older counselor or younger counselor, all that cool stuff. So that's something I've really enjoyed. The reason I started using Pride Counseling as opposed to some of the other online counseling services available is because I was just really tired of explaining things like what cis means to my counselor who I'm paying for this time that I'm spending educating. So uh, I know that those other counselors don't mean any harm. It's not about that. It's just, it is quite exhausting sometimes to have to explain what everything is or why things are an issue or why things are harmful to you. And it's just, it's nice to just be able to get into it and talk about what's going on without having to explain all of the logistics surrounding like why it's complicated to be trans around the holiday season and all that stuff. So that's why I like them. Um, in terms of just online counseling in general, why I started using it and why it's been really helpful for me, they're not asking me to say this, by the way. This is just, I've been itching to make a video about online counseling. I just never wanted to sound too preachy, but like legitimately, I'm just gonna take the time to talk about it for me. It's been a game changer because I don't have to leave my house and I don't even have to leave my bed and I don't even have to answer my phone if I don't feel like I could talk that day. I'm someone who deals with selective mutism and anxiety and agoraphobia. So it's hard for me to leave my house. It's hard for me to talk on the phone. So being able to just message my counselor has been really helpful for me, especially on days where like, I'm having trouble getting out of bed. I'm just, I'm having trouble doing anything. I could just like, shoot them a message and they'll message me back and kind of just like step by step, they'll help me in that moment, in the moment of crisis or the moment of whatever symptoms are manifesting themselves, I get the help right then and there. And that's kind of why I was looking into online counseling. And the reason why it's been super helpful because instead of it being like, this thing happened and here's how I dealt with it, what should I do next time? It's legit like, hey, this thing's happening right now. What should I do? And um, my counselor has been really great at just sort of, you know, step by step walking me through my stuff. So anyway, that's just my little two cent comment on online counseling and why it's been really helpful for me and why I think it might be helpful for other people who deal with seasonal affective disorder. So if you'd like to sign up for Pride Counseling, I'll leave my link in the description. Again, I don't make any commission off of the link. It's just when you use the link, it lets them know and it encourages them to work with me in the future, which is awesome. Cause again, then I could like captioned by videos and stuff like that. So it just, it supports my content kind of indirectly. If you'd like some instructions on how to sign up or what the sign up process is, if you deal with executive dysfunction, anything like that, um, in one of my last videos where I was working with Pride Counseling, I actually made a whole walkthrough. Like I made an alternate account and went through the sign up process in the video and like showed what I was doing on the screen and stuff. And I even went through the application process for financial aid because they offer financial aid, which I think is awesome. So if you'd like a little help walking through the sign up process, you could go to the link in my description, go to that video. I'll put a timestamp and everything for where it is. And uh, yeah, I could walk you through it past me could do that. Anyway, therapy is really helpful. Oh, also just one more little tidbit of advice before you go. When it comes to like family gatherings and stuff like that, what I found really helpful is having a group chat with my friends. And if you don't have that, I made a discord server as some of you might know. Again, I don't, I don't make money off discord. I don't, I don't charge for anything. It's, it's free. You could join. I, I gain nothing from this. I'm just letting you know. Um, because sometimes when you're at a family gathering and people are misgendering you, it just helps to have some friends who are writing your chosen name and using your actual pronouns and just, they're there to support you and you have a little space to vent in. Um, so yeah, that's just, if ever you're looking for some peer support, um, there's always my Discord server. I will also leave a link to that in my description. So hopefully that's also 
something that might help a little bit. Anyway, that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great day and a great week and you take care of yourselves. All right, thanks.